is Susan McCastro. I represent Ward 4 on the Brockton City Council. And this is our second Ward 4 meeting of 2019. And there's about 25 people here this evening and a few more will come in eventually. And I just want to say thank you to all of you for coming tonight. There are so many things going on on May 22nd and you're wonderful to be here tonight. And this evening I also want to thank several of our elected officials who have been kind enough to show up at our Ward 4 meeting. Uh, City Councilor at Large, Jean Bradley, Darren Accord is here. And also Councilor at Large, Win Winthrop Farwell is here. And so far I also have Ward 6 Councilor, Jack Lally. Thank you very much. We've had a busy winter and spring in Ward 4, okay? And I just want to reflect back on our most recent success. On May 14th, just a few weeks ago, at the Zoning Board of Appeals, we had over 60 Ward 4 residents show up and wait patiently through a long Zoning Board of Appeals meeting. Hi, Annabelle. And there was a, um, an application in front of the board to put 173 apartments on Summer Street. And over 10, over 10 residents spoke against it. Three city councilors, including me, spoke against it. And wouldn't you know it was defeated by a vote of four to one. And we are all thrilled about that. Yeah, because it's not a bad idea to put homes there, it's not. Something is going to go there since the factory that was there was torn down last year. But 173 apartments is just too dense considering a lot of factors, the density of the, the, neighbor, the neighborhood, the narrowness of Summer Street, the fact that Summer Street has no sidewalks and no sidelines. It just was not a great idea. Many of you were at that meeting that night and I just want to applaud all of you. It's because of you and you're hanging on to the very end, that meeting went until after 11 o'clock, and you're speaking up that that was defeated. So I congratulate all of you as well. So this evening, I'm going to go through a few things that are going to be going on affecting Ward 4, but first I'd like to ask my first speaker to speak, the, the, uh, the head of the, the Brockton Patrolman's Union, and an officer for a long time here, Patrolman Officer Bill Healy. Good evening, everyone. My name's Bill Haley. Some of you know me. Brockton police officer, now 31 years, nine years doing crime watch. I got some things here that I hope you'll be satisfied with and other things you won't be. And it's regarding summertime coming, noise complaints, and one of the biggest complaints that begin June 1 only in Brockton, fireworks. And usually end sometimes in September. So I got the law on that what we do about it, and hopefully you'll be informed of what I have to say. The most important thing, and we're going to learn from this, you, the counselor, and myself, with any feedback you have. Contact info, if you want to set up a crime watch in your neighborhood, all you have to do is go online to the Brockton Police Department uh, website. There you'll see Neighborhood Business Watch, my name, and all the uh, contact information, my email address, my phone number, and the all-important tip line. Those are separate links. Click onto that, and that is the best way you can reach out with some of the complaints that you have. Um, just as recently, and, and by the way, when you reach out by way of like email address, my email address, and you want to start a, a neighborhood watch, I'll get back to you with all the information on how to go about doing it. Very simple, reach out to me. The Crime Watch program, which has been around since the late 60s, early 80s in this city, totally uh, anonymous. You'll never, I, I could never, I couldn't, I didn't have to, I wouldn't have to reveal the name of a source to a superior court judge program's been established that long, and the same with the tip line. But the tip line, in which if you read the paper on a daily basis, 
you'll see a raid or so in this city every week. There's something going on, be it a drug and or gun raid. And a lot of those raids was because of anonymous tips. People that, the people that contact or, or go onto the tip line, even I don't know who they are. It generates a number. So nobody has to be intimidated or afraid to, to use the tip line. Many of people in the city, for whatever reason, they're intimidated to call the police. And what they tend to do, and I'm gonna address the counselor right now, not admonish her, but address, they call the counselor, not just this counselor, other counselors. And I'm gonna give you a prime example as to what happened as recently as today. Sue sent an email, and because we're on TV, which I don't like to do because of the anonymous anonymity of the program, I'm not gonna give addresses, nor would I ever give names. But in her award, she received a complaint regarding loud music. And this loud music's played according to the constituent to suit this morning when she sent this email. It's weekday afternoons and on weekends, continuing late into the evening. Sue was told that the music is excessively loud and disturbing the peace. Other residents and homeowners in the vicinity, including this particular constituent, reported this. And Sue would like that we kindly increase patrols and if observed, direct volume reduction. The issue with this is so now today, when I, when I arrived at work at four o'clock, I printed out the address in which this person or persons continue to play the loud music and I went back to January 1st of 2018. There were four calls there. Two of those calls were motor vehicle stops in front of that residence. Another one was a medical emergency, and the other call was to see the complainant, unknown why. Whoops, sorry. My point being, all of these people are complaining. I don't doubt that that may be the case, but people sat in their homes for whoever knows how long and they seethed. The police aren't doing anything. The police department never received a call regarding this address, but Sue did today and it appears it's been an ongoing issue. So when Sue writes to the captain, to me, to the chief of police, we're not jumping on this particular call until we do our research. What needs to happen is, and I'll give you an example of how it works, what needs to happen is you need to help yourself. You need to call the police, the non-emergency line, in this particular case of a disturbance, 508-941-0200. Why it hurts Sue and the other, not just Sue, all of the other counselors, many of them have been on for a long time and they've been educated with the process. Jay Stewart, if you recall him from years ago, he, he was very aggressive wanted to do the right thing. Me and him received several emails from Jace. Jace and I became buddies, met up with the constituents. We would meet up and discuss and air out their grievances. And from that point forward, we had a good working relationship. That's how it gets done, working together with a counselor. Not any counselor directing the police what to do without having all of the adequate st uh, stats or facts. It will never work that way. And in fairness to Sue, if she's taking calls from the constituents and she says, I'll look into that and I'll work on that. Well, when it doesn't get resolved in a day, Sue doesn't get a vote. So do the right thing, help yourself, reach out the way I'm telling you to reach out to and things will work better. And this is how it happens when it works better. Where's Councilor Lally? In Councilor Lally's uh, ward, there's a musician that lives in the neighborhood. He plays the drums extremely loud. We know who he is. It's been on Click Fix, it's been everywhere. An extremely loud drum player. Here in front of me are 10 disturbance calls beginning the end of May. Beginning the end of May, 10 disturbance calls. Captain Mark Picaro, who's in charge of the patrol division, wanted action taken, but we took action after X amount of calls. I know it's frustrating, but most of these calls started on 4.30, what's today, 20, 21 days ago, 22 days ago. Then the police took action, and the action was this. We went down on 5.19, spoke to the musician, 
the musician apologized and said he had since in the past couple of days insulated his entire place. You know about this call? Insulated the entire place, soundproofing, etc. The officer who went down there, per Captain Picaro, to take out an application for complaint, not arrestable, to take out a complaint for disturbing the peace, said, you were, to, you were to take photos, give me any building receipts you have, come down and see Captain Picaro no later 20, than 24 hours from now. If that isn't true and you don't show me proof that you've done what you did, we'll take out a complaint and we'll see you in court at a date later. So that's how we'll take care of issues. Not, not one whole summer of people pulling their hair out of their head, all upset, the police don't do anything, yet the police have never been informed. So if we do it just the way I tell you to do it, life will be so much easier, things will get done, and we'll be held accountable. Every time a counselor, here's my Ward 4 folder from just three weeks ago. Everything Sue sends to me and to other people, everything is backed up because I might have to answer to a higher power, the mayor or the chief. And I have all of the answers to everything that I do. It's just because it's my mental illness. I'm OCD type thing, been doing this thing here for years. Nobody's more organized. I have everything going back nine years in file cabinets. So when you say that you spoke to me, I'll look it up and you're either lying or you're you know, trying to grease the wheel, you know, the squeaky wheel thing here. So that's how we could solve these noise complaints. And now moving into the summertime, Windows start to open, house parties. House parties in this city, christenings begin at 11 p.m. They go till three or four. Ninety percent of the people, and I worked the midnight shift for 22 years, 22 years on the midnight shift, 90 percent of the people that are having these baby christenings, you go in, they're nothing but polite. They offer food, dinner, sit down. They just don't, seriously polite, and there's only so much you're going to do, up until the third call or so. And then the discretion comes in, party's over. Neighbors are going crazy, as they should be. Next time, invite your neighbor. They may not call. And some of the tactics we use when going to these parties, these house parties, that it's an attitude thing. We go in, and all of a sudden, they're dropping F-bombs at the police. Cars are being tagged. Cars are being towed. People are being arrested. You go into the scenario I just mentioned earlier, they're very, they're very polite, they're offering food, it's discretion, people. No one's, no one's mandating, no one's mandating, nobody, that the police shall, upon one call, make an arrest, shut down the party. So it's discretionary. Sue had talked to, I'm not throwing you under the bus here, could I mention something else? Agree or disagree? Sue, and I'm loving it. <laughs> so Sue, Sue and Captain Picaro had talked about these noise, dis, these, uh, noise complaints, because it's a big thing in every ward. In every ward, it's a big to-do. There is no ordinance drafted. Captain Picaro, I don't know if I mentioned this, he's an attorney, practicing attorney, as is Sue. And they've read this ordinance regarding noise. And a big thing, people will start with, if you, if you, I, have to, I have to monitor the click fix also as part of my thing. Click fix is another, another way to you address not house parties that are currently going, but like, I use this as an example, potholes, lighting. Don't go on to click fix saying party's been going all weekend long, what are you doing about it? It doesn't get answered that way. It gets answered by way of 911 or the non-emergency line or if it's an ongoing issue in your neighborhood, such as a drug issue, the tip line, or my email address, crimewatch.brockdenpolice.com. So, uh, the ordinance currently on the books in the city, an attorney can understand it. Do you agree? She agrees, she's read it. Now, Sue and the other counselors have been backlogged with the marijuana uh, um, thing here in the city. Ordinance, marijuana ordinance taking up a lot of time. I go to every council meeting on Mondays as part of my job. I get to meet the, the uh, get to hear from the counselors about their constituents. 
so it, it backlogged them. So as of today, we're well out an ordinance with any teeth that can prevent, that, that prevents the police from knocking up on the door, let's say a single family home. You own this house? Yes, I do. $500 fine, as an example. Now, Jay Stewart and I, several years ago, tried to work on that, and I reached out to the registry and other people, and I wanted to have it work so that the registry, you realize if you get a parking ticket and you don't pay it, and you go to get your license renewed, they won't renew your license until the fine. Does everyone know that? I was looking for that type of an ordinance. <laughs> I was looking for that. But here's the problem, though. I was looking for that type of an ordinance, uh, which would be combined with the state. We'd have to work on our state reps to get this to work, where now I go to your home. I know that this is the actual homeowner. I give that citation, we'll say $500. I'm not paying this thing they throw in the rubbish. No big deal. See you when you get your license renewed. That's teeth that the police would have and would enjoy doing. And I'm telling you, I'm throwing this number out. 50% of these parties would end with something like that. But without something such as the registry being involved, and, and again, she was, Sue was going to work on this, and work on it with our state reps, that's something that we would have so much more power versus now, we do, we do, if you're polite, like I already said, and, and we're compassionate, in a house party that, you know, I go the first time at this house party, you know, the four to 12 shift, it's 10 o'clock at night, hey, you, you, you gotta keep it down. Sorry, officer, they leave, there's not another call until after midnight. Now I'm on the midnight shift, we'll say, now I come, hey, how you doing, officer? Hey, can you do us a favor? Can, cause she, that person's only getting one warning on this shift from me. Now the second time comes, it would be fantastic if that could be worked on. And again, the, all the counselors were backlogged. So moving forward in the summer, call. Don't not call, and we'll get down there. A disturbance loud music is a priority three. The dispatch system is like a triage. The person bleeding the most, he gets first dibs with a doctor. The splinter gets, you know, third dibs. We work the same way with dispatch. Disturbance call, although aggravating, is a priority three. If, if there's a car available on that sector, right away he goes to the call. If he's backed up, if the, if the city were backed up on calls, that call waits. Believe it or not, you could, that call could come in on a Friday night at 8 o'clock, on a Friday night, and that call may not be answered till 4 o'clock in the morning on the midnight shift. We don't even, do, I'm not saying it's common, but we don't even delete the call from the system. It stays until it gets a police response. Unless the considerate neighbor calls to say, you don't have to send a car, that party's been over for an hour. Then we'll, then we'll clear that call in house. But other than that, the police go on every call, including a call that's eight hours old, even though there hasn't been any more calls. I don't like it, but I don't run the show. So. Does everybody understand the dis disturbance thing? It's a, which we might, as well, we might as well go right into fireworks. Well, this one's. You can all tell that Officer Healy has been at this for a while and knows what he's doing. Now, this is something you don't have to believe me. It's Mass General Law. If you Google Chapter 148, Section 39 on fireworks, it tells you the layout. Very frustrating, like I kind of jokingly said, fireworks seem to start here in June and they go all summer long, it seems. Everyone complains about it and I get it. I think there's only two states in the nation that fireworks are illegal. Every state in the nation, fireworks illegal. Did I say illegal here? Illegal in mass, and I forget the other state or two, that it's illegal to possess fireworks. So under the law, if you are selling fireworks out of your truck, fine or imprisonment, a hundred to a thousand dollar fine, maximum one year in prison, and it's a mandatory seizure. So the police show up on the call, I see See George here selling fireworks out of the trunk? 
confiscate fireworks, take out a complaint, an application for complaint, a criminal complaint, where he now sees the officer uh, in court and they, and they go over the case. He probably has to get a lawyer. And he would have to get a lawyer because there's a jail sentence hanging over his head, possibly. That's for the seal of fireworks. Um, oh, this is the other one. I want to, I want to make this, this language clear. There's an option. Did you say option? There is an option for the guy selling the fireworks we can arrest. We can actually arrest and confiscate. Mandatory, mandatory, I have to take those fireworks or I'm in trouble, and I may or may not have to arrest. Possession in the use, the people that are throwing the firecrackers out, police are called. $10 to $100 fine. Mandatory, I have to take those fireworks, but I, I think you may realize the police get there, there's a group of people, firecracker, wrappings all on the street, nobody has them in their possession, we move on. Um, mandatory, I seize those fireworks, seize them. We can take out a court complaint, no right of arrest. So we seize, no right of arrest. Um, if convicted on any of these scenarios I mentioned, if convicted, they don't get their fireworks back. They go to the state police bomb squad and they blow them up. So I, again, kind of weak language. Um, there's no right of people aren't afraid of it. Everybody does it across the country. It's not a big to do in the world. It, now, the ones that light off those fireworks that look like the fair, that's a big issue. Any officer I would like to think that's going to that call and actually sees this will ma be mandated to, to confiscate and I would hope that he, at a minimum, takes out a complaint for something that could be an absolute disaster, hazard, being that they burned down a house with the big ones. Um, so that's the firework stuff. I, I hate to say it, but I don't, the law is the law. I don't even know if city council can make an ordinance on firework. You know what I mean? So. It's one of those things, especially around the fourth, you got to kind of, it's bad, but you got to kind of, and, and by the way, don't ever not call, don't ever not call the police if you think, I don't know if that's a gunshot or fireworks, call the police and say you think it's, you think it's a gunshot. That's important. Um, another, oh, uh, another thing, uh, piece of advice, uh, not advice, a, uh, a uh, what do you call it? public outreach, don't get, don't get duped into this nonsense. There's a, there's a fraudulent fundraising company, National Police Support Fund. We haven't heard about it. They've been making calls or either sending out mailers. My opinion, especially to our elders, they're always sympathetic and they like the police. One of the few people that do, the elders. Like the police, do not give a nickel to this organization. The uh, Better Business Bureau, the IRS are looking into their practices. We have never heard of it. They might call and say this is for the P Brockton Police Association. As, as Sue mentioned, I'm president of the Patrolman's Association. I have been for 14 years. We don't fundraise. We don't need to. We don't take any of your money. So when they start calling anybody saying this is for the police, my advice is give zero. Um, anyways, that's being looked into by those two organizations. Um, park invite, everyone's talking about speeding. Um, I mentioned this uh, at Ann's uh, Ward 5 meeting. I talked about it, I'll talk briefly on it, and I'll take any questions you may have. In 2018, 2018, for moving, mo moving and anybody could, uh, after I'm done with this, could raise their hand to ask about their street. I have a printout of every street. No, oh, stand by. I got parking tickets and moving violations. Hold on one second.
So um, in, 2000, in 2018, moving violations, speeding, going through stop signs, we generated in, in Massachusetts, it's against, quotas are against the law. There's no quotas in Mass. The chief of police cannot say, I expect X amount of tickets from you. It's against the law. And if he were to do it, the union would grieve such a thing. So just so that you know that, we generated $371,775. $3,400 of those were civil in nature. Stop sign, red light. We're compassionate. We gave 1,582 warnings, verbal warnings. Why? Because we can. It's discretionary. Nobody, the chief, the governor, the president can say, you shall give tickets. They can't do it. It's discretionary. Have a good attitude. You might be let off with a warning. Um, oh, those were written warnings. I'm sorry. Eight verbal warnings. There's way more than eight, but they just don't log them. There's a, I, I, give, I give eight in a month. Um, 485 arrests were generated from pulling over a car for violating the law, be it a sticker, red light, etc. And we took out 1,105 complaints. You pull the car over, suspended license, you take out a complaint. Or you can arrest. Uh, car goes through, re uh, through flashing red lights of a bus. It's a huge fine of like 500, I think, maximum. It's a criminal complaint. If you go through a, uh, uh, through a bus with the red, red lights flashing, criminal complaint, serious stuff. Um, so again, $371,775 in 2018. 2019, and this was a big to-do, uh, and it was a big to-do for uh, Councilor Beauregard in her ward uh, and elsewhere. She got complaints from everybody. So I brought this up at her, at her meeting. I'll bring it up here. We generated $141,695 in, pa in parking ticket violations alone. Um, that's 3,032 tickets the Brockton Police Department issued to, to uh, parking violations. 3,032, these aren't made up stats that come right off the system. To, to read up false stats would be criminal, so. Uh, this would be from uh, January 1. 2018, 1231 of 2018. I didn't generate because I'm going to wait. Uh, last snowstorm, there was a lot of craziness. I think there was a ward, uh, there was a council meeting regarding it. There were 60 cars towed, towed on that last storm alone. That last storm alone, and it wasn't a big storm. We towed 60 cars. Uh, uh, one of the councilors, a friend of mine, you know, her opinion was should have been more. There should have been more tickets. Well, to, to, to tow when Councilor Fowell had brought this up at the council meeting, because we had the traffic commissioner there, Captain John Hallisey, to tow a car is in itself like a one hour process. You know, by the time the, the, the tow truck leaves the, sh the shop, picks up, lifts up the car in the storm, brings it back, going slower because it's a snowstorm, it's a to do. So you'd have to have an unbelievable amount of manpower and tow trucks at your disposal. So we do the best we can. I know it's summertime now, but to keep this in mind, it's triage again. If there's complaints in the police work, they usually have four to six guys working the snow detail. DPW is calling, plow trucks, dispatcher. If there's, if there's like the narrow roads in particular downtown on the side streets, if those streets are blocked where a plow can't get down, priority one, off goes the cruiser, off goes the tow truck. The streets that are as wide as Main Street, priority three. We'll get to it when we can, but we've got to make sure that the narrow streets are open. Very simple. It hurts some people, and it is what it is. And I'm telling you, for as long as I'm here and going 50 years from now, this process will never change. Never. Unless you want to spend a fortune in tow equipment and police overtime. And you can't even get like a guy like me to go out in the snow. So, and, and you're not mandated you're not mandated to go and work that overtime to do that optional work. Um, so that's the traffic uh, ticket off. And I, I think that's it. It's summertime. Just a, my, my, my yearly warning. Kids get out of school. They might not even be the worst kids in the world, but they go around there. They do things they shouldn't do and they regret taking things from cars. 
If your cars aren't locked, if you don't lock your doors today, shame on you. I've been saying this for nine years. All of the, all of the not all of, well over 90% of stuff taken from cars, the reports, and I read the reports all the time, will be unlocked, unlocked car doors. Or um, purse, wallet, computer, front seat, the window smashed. Because like I always say at these things, it's like a dog looking at a you know, T-bone steak. It's gonna, they're going to break it and take, the, and, take the, and take what's the contents of the car. So lock your car and leave nothing in it visible that tempts somebody to, that tempts somebody to break into it. Uh, when you leave your home, I've always said this, I live in a raised ranch here in the city. If I'm out on the back deck, the front, I come in, the screen's on, screen door, right? That screen door is locked so that when I'm on the deck, someone's not coming in through the front door. Scam, they'll say, uh, if you catch them, hey, so, hey, what are you doing? Hey, does, does Susie live here? There's no Susie here. <laughs> Out they go. Happens a lot. People just go in and act like they're in the house. Checking for unlocked doors like they check for unlocked car doors. They'll do the same thing to your house. Keep everything locked up. When you go out for even, an, even for five minutes, for five minutes, and your, and your first floor windows are unlocked, you never know who's living in your neighborhood who's watching. And that's when most of this happens. Uh, beginning of the winter for three months, there were like 15, uh, 15 plus snow blowers stolen out of unlocked sheds. So unlocked, every one of them. Keep it in mind, lock everything up. You won't be calling the police. The, the person, your neighbor will for, for uh, an unlocked door or an unlocked window. Um, does anybody have uh, anything? Oh. Where? oh, to my buddy, ex-school teacher over there, right there. He's everywhere, this guy. Thank you, Lieutenant. Very, inf very informative. I have two Pat questions patrol for you. Patrolman, but go ahead. Thank you for the promotion. Thank you for the promotion. Go ahead. Well, I'm also a strong unionist. I'm a high school teacher. <laughs> So anyways, I have two questions for you. Did the police department receive the noise boxes? I know the city councils voted on that last year. Noise boxes. That they, when they go to a party, that they have the noise boxes determined. Yes. Yes. Did you receive them? Um, I am like 99.99% positive. We did not. And that's a misconception, too, about the decibel... Oh, Sue's telling me they didn't even vote on them. And, and, fur, and, and fur, furthermore, one other thing, too, about the noise complaints, there's this uh, misconception, like there's a decibel level. If, if, like I worked, I told you, the midnight shift for over, you know, like 21, 22 years, whatever it's been, right? Midnight shift, my sleeping time was, you know, I was sleeping at noontime. If the guy next to me has that radio blaring uncontrollably, that, that's a disturbance call. It doesn't have to be when it's dark. So again, you call the police, 10 o'clock in the morning, noontime, you show up and you hear outrageously loud music. Hey, buddy, your, na your neighbors are calling and complaining. Couple is sleeping. Lower the music. So there's not some magic decibel meter that will register, that will tell us if it's, if it's you know, decibel when it's low is louder, right? L lower the decibel on the meter, the louder. There's nothing like that that we have in I think that would go back to the ordinance that might be put together one day that... Oh, you hear that? I did. I did. Like the health department has them, and I, I, don't, I don't understand that. Oh, well, you clarified that, and thank yeah. you. All right. My second question to you is, or well, second comment, last year, 4th of July weekend, all hell broke loose in the city. And we come to find out when the police chief went in front of the city council, they only had 15 police officers on July 3rd and 4th. Now, to me, there's something wrong with that. We have, we have Memorial Day weekend this weekend. We have 4th of July and Labor Day, three big party, party weekends. Well, to me, you should have at least eight cars on and 30 police on, on holiday weekends. Yep. And I might also, I want to ask you a question. Isn't it also uh, extra pay for holidays for police officers? No. <clears throat> no? Okay, then. No. All right. So, so uh, I'm just, we need more police on holiday weekends. 
those yep. three. So I remember the chief talking about that because I was at that council meeting as you were. When he said 15, I'm, I'm pretty sure and I don't have that particular roster in front of me. Every day generates a roster, every shift does. The 15 that were working that, that day, that didn't include the police officers at the fairgrounds. The police officers work in details all across the city. So when, as you said, all hell breaks loose, they're at the disposal. They'd, they'd leave a, a detail if they, if they had to. So granted, you had 15 people actually answering calls. We'd love to have 30. You know, the minimum manning on, a, the minimum manning on, on, a, uh, on any day, like on the midnight shift, on Monday through Friday is eight, in, eight on patrol. I think it's 12 or 15 on the four to 12 shift on, on, on a, any given day weekend. Uh, so we'd love to have 30, and, and that would happen if, they, if, if we had more, poli more police officers. I'm not, I'm not here to say we need, you know, we do, but I'm not here to like, it's costly. So we do what we can, and, and there's actually another class coming on, and we're up higher than we've ever been. But I think when he was mentioned that he mentioned 15 calls for service, but between undercover and guys working details in the city on that particular day, there's no doubt in my mind, because I've did it for decades, there's 40 plus guys in the city on, on you know, like carrying firearms, you know. Lawmen. In fairness to our police department, based on the population of the city, they are 28 police officers shot. And we've got to keep that in mind. They need more police. They need more police. I think they do a great job for the amount of police officers they do have. Did you have some? Oh, oh you're gonna have to talk on that, but it's all right. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm Peg Kearney, and um, I s restarted the Crime Watch for Country Club area. Yep. Oh, yep. Um, <laughs> uh, nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. We know what to do in the future. Yes. Okay. <laughs> no, no, but um, so we did have a meeting, Susan King. Yep. Um, but um, in talking to other offices, um, not at the meeting, but just myself. Yep. Um, I was told to encourage everyone to call. So our problem is drug buys yep. in the car street. Car to car. Car to car. Um, so we see them. Sometimes we get the plate. Most of the time we don't, but we might get the kind of cars. Yep. Um, so we were told that we should call the business number and ask it to be logged. So you people will know how many are really happening. So I want to know if that procedure is correct, um, and also if that procedure is correct, one of the neighbors called and they said, we don't do that. If you don't need a car, we don't do that. So go online and report it online. Even if we have to do it online, does it get like in your log or whoever's log so they you. know how many really are happening? Yep. So was it Tom or Tim before you? You don't Tim, have to give the last name. Tim. Tim resigned Tim. from like the crime watch they position. They moved away. Yeah. Oh, they moved. They moved. Yeah. What he and others in the neighborhood have done for years, I once had an active watch meeting there like seven years ago. I think I wrote you that. Yeah. Somebody's downstairs, 60 plus people showed up at Country Club, uh, Country Club Crime Watch. My, my first one. They've sent me, and I suggest that everybody in your neighborhood does the same thing. You could send me by way of email Brockton Police Department website, Neighborhood Business Watch, my email address. Bill, just want to let you know, this plate, these two plates, look like a car-to-car -car deal. I will have the plate, I will log it. This is the most frustrating thing about this. I've been saying it for nine years here. These car-to-car -car deals are designed so that they basically don't get caught other than luck. It's a quick transaction. I'm hoping that you're going to respond by saying you haven't seen it recently. It, three in a week. Three in a week. Okay. So it's the same, probably the same deal of meeting at that location. What I was going to say is, what I was going to say is that they, they, they tend to move to another block, to another street. See, years ago we would raid homes. 
right, raid homes going back a decade plus, and all of the contents, all the drug contents were in the home. Now they take a possession amount, just the amount that won't put them in prison for many a years, but just for possession use, say marijuana or cocaine, and they'll only be charged with possession versus distribution. So they take it out of the home, they hop it in the car, and they deliver it to you. And then they move on, even if the police were to be, happen to be there, because you know when you call, they're gone. Uh, exactly. And, and, that, and, 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 that, it's, and, it's, and it's designed that way, it's designed that way not to get caught. So I understand why you don't call, and I guess if you know it's the, the same two cars, you know it's going to be quick. I, I, w I don't, I don't want to say don't call, but certainly the car that's suspicious, that's been parked there for like, you know, 10 minutes, you make that, you make that phone call for suspicious motor vehicle, and I have many of cases, uh, Mellon Street Watch Group up off of North Main on the Avon line, they called two years ago, I told this and I shared it with the audience there and others, they made a call, a neighbor looking out at one o'clock in the morning, that car had taken, uh, had, had got lost, the occupant of that car came off of, came off of Harrison Boulevard, pulls onto Mellon, calls up his contact to new good police officers, like, like they're on the ball in there. Right? They get into that car by asking for license reg, all sorts of like shaky movements going on. They're concerned for their safety. They get in that car and the backpack it is X pounds of marijuana and thousands in cash, all because he got lost. So just somebody who was, you know, hey, what's that car doing there? Those things happen, the car to car thing, I'm almost at a loss to say, other than they, they move on. So in short, Give me the plate number. It'll go in the country club lane, just like Sue has a Ward 4 folder with those plates. And the most important plate of all of the ones that you give me will be the plate that comes up all the time. Right. That's more than likely your dealer. And then from that, if it doesn't say leased by enterprise rental, or the other issue with a car to car, you give the description or so, the car belongs to the bad guy's mother. Yeah. You'll get, you know, you'll get 62-year-old female, and you knew that it wasn't. And so it's a very difficult thing, and that's why these guys who lawyered up decades ago and used to keep everything in their home now chose this mode of, of dealing. So it's difficult. Um, there's a few police officers that I believe live in your neighborhood. We won't name them. Right. And so, you know, We'll do what we call the directed patrols, drive through the neighborhood. Is it a day thing or is it a night thing or is it day yeah. and night? Early morning and late afternoon. Early morning, late afternoon. Uh, I'll mention something like this to Captain Picaro to pick up, and this is just sounds superficial because it kind of is. When possible, directed patrol into the neighborhood, this beautiful neighborhood, off the beaten path, and you know, you deserve it, taxpayer. And you'll and you'll you'll see a, you'll see a cru cruiser or two. It's just one of those. It's one of those things. And I'm and I and I wish you had said to me because you had written to me like a month and a half ago that this had stopped because, like I said, they move. They it. Mo I thought it had stopped um, because around the time of the meeting, neighbors in one of the offices followed somebody and told them to stay the heck away. Yeah. But we've had three this week. Probably not the same guy, though, right? Huh? Probably not the same car as before, though, right? Yeah. No. And, well, they are all seem to be different. Right. Even, like, all six cars seem yep. to be different. It's, it's <laughs> difficult, and there's, they no, know there's, no, there's no magic wand for this. It's just, it's just, it, yeah. it's, it's actually a genius type way to of, of, right. of evade Right. So, if, even if we don't have the plate... Yep. And we have just the make and type of car. Color, you can send that. that. We can still send it. Send to it. You. Bill, here's another plate. All right. And then I'll run it. I'll respond to you that I, I. I'll respond to you that I. I'll respond to you that I received it. And if you could actually get a description, I could actually respond by saying, you know, that person you described. This is who the car is owned by. And you'll and you'll see my 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 point. It will be a rental, or it will be somebody who it doesn't need, who, who, who somebody else who owns it. Sorry. Any, anybody else? Go ahead, buddy. Good evening, Patrolman. My How name is you? Joe. I live on Coral Street in Brockton. Yep. And um, 
I moved in almost three years ago, and the neighborhood watch was great because while I was in the process of buying the house, a youth broke into the home, broke some windows. I got a phone call as a potential buyer. The, the seller of the house got a phone call, and the real estate agents got a phone call, so we all went down. Um, I've been living there three years. Last summer, we had a lot of drug activity on the street. Yep. And like you say, the car to car. And every time the cruiser would get down, the car would be gone. Um, one night, one afternoon, we actually went out there and told them, listen, take that stuff off the street because we don't want it here. A couple of weeks ago on a Saturday, I came home from work. There was a black vehicle parked down by South Lydon Street and Coral Street with three youth outside. The conversation consisted on they had laid a beating up on somebody. And I remember, they I remember, this is how my mind works. I remember this particular call because I'm crazy. I remember this. Okay. And a motorcycle unit showed up. The motorcycle right? unit showed up for two seconds and left. They never checked IDs on these youth or nothing, and then just took off. They should have at least checked IDs. They talked about capping somebody. What if they had a gun in that vehicle? So here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. This is why... This is where I remember it. I read this, and I read tons of stuff, and I could only remember it. For whatever reason, I remember this. And I think I remember it because just because you are in your home and, and the police action is what it is, you don't actually know. It could have been, as, and I'm not saying this is the case, it could have been as simple as, hey, what are you doing in front of this house? And an ID is shown, I'm not saying this happened, that the person lives there. And just because a group of people, be it one, two, or three, are on the street, Maybe in front of their home, maybe in front of a friend's home. I, I, I don't know, sir. Nor do you. Nor do you. You just don't know. And I, and I don't actually know. But, but the scenario is to be dragged, uh, thrown up against the hood, uh, searched because it, it just doesn't work that way. Now, there could have been a guy with a gun. I, I can't answer for the officers that showed up, but I remember seeing the, I remember seeing the email, the complaint about it, and it was like, they did nothing. Well, they, they did nothing to you, and, and, I, and I don't know how old the kids well, I, were. I didn't call back. I didn't put a complaint in, but yeah. I gave my name and my phone number when I made the call so that they knew yeah. it wasn't a fake call. That I was in my yard and listened to this conversation for 20 minutes yeah. before I called the officers, before I called the station. I left them with a return phone number and everything, and nobody yeah. even called me back. I didn't file any, so it had to be yeah, another yeah. neighbor. Yep. Um, that was involved. The vehicle had been there a couple nights prior in the same spot. Yep. Now, whether it was drug activity then, I don't know, but at this particular time, they, had, they were talking about a beating that had taken place mm -hmm. and that they should have capped the person. Um, to me, I grew up in, in the inner city in Boston, and I know what those words mean and what it usually ends up as. Yep. So my concern was that somebody, they were going back after somebody. I, I get you. And there's a lot of bravado and people, guys talk like, you know, like they talk there and nothing really ever happens. They've never held a gun. They never, and it's just, it's, it's lip service. I'm not saying this is the scenario. Could it also have been that the officers that showed up because you said it was a quick stop and go? Very quick. Could they have known the guy? I don't know. Could it have been a family member of the officer? I don't know. I just don't know it. So I can't give you the answer other than I remember seeing it and I checked on the call and that's why I remembered it. And the, and the end of the call was it was settled, you know, matters settled. It was settled, they went, they looked, they talked, they moved on. And I, I can't, you, you nor I can answer as to what was spoken between the parties, including the police. And it, it very well could have been something like a, a relative. And I, and I remember, and, and Sue received that email from you, and I remember reading it, and I looked into it, and Sue's response was, again, this is why I said it earlier, you can't be like, something has to be done. Well, in this one particular call in front of this home, based on exactly what you said, what could possibly be done after that particular call? Nothing. Nothing, nothing legally. Um, just, just one more thing, I know I'm, I'm boring myself. Uh, with my speeding. So there was, a, there was down the street, down the, uh, I, I got a com complaint, there was a speeder, uh, the person who was speeding, uh, the neighbor knew him, wanted the counselor to let the police know who this person was who was speeding. Under mass criminal law, if there's two cars that, that are involved in a car crash and the police get there and both cars are off to the side of the road, off to the side of the road, and you walk up to one of the occupants of the car and say, can I see your license, please? And he says, I don't have a license, officer. It's suspended. 
you can't arrest. You could take out a complaint. The police officer in Massachusetts has to see the operation. You have to see it. If I'm driving down the road and there's a speeder and I pull the car over and I ask for a license, he says, officer, I don't have it. It's been suspended, arrestable. So I bring up that scenario because the scenario that was relayed to me regarding the speeder on a street that I won't name, the police are never going to that person's house hours or a day later, never, and asking, were you speeding? <laughs> Get off my property, and I mean it. That's, that's, so we, we work when we, when we have, under probable cause or reasonable suspicion. We just don't go knocking on doors asking things because we don't want egg on our face. So I, I bring that up about like the speeding issue. And, no. In the case of people speeding, or drag racing on a street, okay, with lots of young children on it, the, the resident wants to know what can be done. Well, it's an enforcement issue, I know that. All right, so what is the likelihood that you're going to park a car there? I asked the resident to, I said I would report it, I said the residents have to do some work on their own, get license plates get make and model of the car, get time of day. Because I want to encourage you guys, look, here's enough information, perhaps a directed patrol, perhaps a car parked. This is very hard because you guys are understaffed, we all know that, but yet we don't want a child to be hurt. We need something, okay? And then on the other one, on Coral Street, of course we know that you can't go after the fact and correct motorcycle drivers who let somebody go, whatever. But the other thing I wrote to you about is there is a pattern of drug deals. The people on Coral Street are finding syringes. They're finding paraphernalia on the ground. So I asked for additional patrol, and I also asked separately DPW to put up a light, which I, I'm told I'm going to get. I don't have it yet. So, so super, like with Coral Street, let's go with the speeding incident. There's, there's four people that currently are in the uh, traffic division under Captain John Hallisey. Uh, the council has sent an email we got on this particular street, streets. And what happens when it comes to the traffic division, I could read out any street that you, you yell at me and I could tell you how many times there were stops on, on, on any street. Court Street's always a big complaint. The traffic division goes from street to street to street based on so when you sent me that along with the Captain Hallisey and Picaro, it's Captain Hallisey's job as the, as, the, as the captain in charge of traffic enforcement to, set, to put that on the list of, of a street in which people have been complaining about speeding. And that goes on that list. But again, it's, it's one of these things with help yourself. Everybody in this city speeds. Everybody in every town. Every city, everybody's speed, old and young, old and young, speeding right up on my rear end, driving here. Everybody's doing it. Everybody's distracted. Everybody's in a big hurry. Slow down. Collectively, everybody should start talking to neighbors. It's, it's like in that street you mentioned, it's a neighbor that lives there. And to answer the question about, you know, like the danger of um, kid being struck, it could happen on any street any time the way people drive in the city. T two years or three years ago, they had the big campaign on pedestrian traffic. 11 or 12 people were killed walking the streets. How was that our fault? 11 or 12 people walking the streets of the city killed by speeders across the entire city, including one poor person on West Chestnut Street at one in the morning. How do you get hit by a car at one in the morning on West Chestnut Street? There's something involved with that. that, that that person went in front of that car, and I, you know, I gotta be kid. You know, that's how it was read, and that person with that person called the police immediately, in tears, one o'clock in the month. So if that can happen anywhere, and all we can do is, in the speeding issue, is that goes on the, on the list of streets, to, and, I, and I read the stats to you, you know, all the moving violations, so we're always out there. That's just not the traffic division, that's anybody who wears the uniform was on a patrol. So, that's... Hi, I got a question about um, when you were talking about, say, uh, the loud parties and everything else as far as the summertime, 
Do you guys close the books each year as far as on, say, like uh, the same location? Like, say, for instance, you have one house that you've been uh, going to for, say, like the last three or four years. I mean, that's, isn't that, that's a patent, I mean, that should be addressed. You have, you have people as far as who will have parties that, well, it's kind of <coughs> like a, um, what do you call it? Uh, they're having a commercial event on a public, like, like on a pr uh, residential home. Like, they're charging for you to get into their uh, place. They're supplying the booze and everything else and the music. But yet, the, uh, the only people who are getting anything out of it are the neighbors who are always calling the police because you, you, can't, you can't hear anything because it is just too loud. And when you... For instance, like last year, 88 South Layton Street. Uh, power was cut to the house, but yet neighbors were supplying electrical cords. They had generators to keep the party going. What? What happened? What, 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 what will be done this year as far as, I mean, everyone, they find new, new ways to have parties, but for, can you hold a commercial event in a, in a residential area? No. So, but, but here's the thing. You mentioned this particular party, and I, I answered this earlier. You may say that, and I'm not saying it doesn't happen, there may be that ongoing party, like last summer, every single weekend, nonstop. All you have to do, the council or anybody else, you email me. I could, I could run, now, run those stats. I'm going to show you something here. I'm going to cover up the name of the street. This is what I talked about when we went down to get a complaint. The musician. See that there? Just look at it. Here's all the calls. Here's the type of calls. People started calling about this particular musician. Now, the street you're talking about, the street that you're talking about, if I went to, if you gave me that street and looked at it, the particular address, I'd like to think that there'd be 15 to 20 calls there. And then if that's the case, that's when I come in, especially if it's a rental. If it's a rental, I go to the, it's not, unfortunately. I go to the assessor's uh, uh, database, find out who owns the place, right, and make phone calls. They don't want to comply with their tenants being unruly. We send out code enforcement. These are the type of tools that I can use. They find out that when code enforcement goes, the fire escape is broken down. Thousands of dollars in fines. That's what we can do. But you could have a particular, the, the street and the incident you're talking about, it, and you now know how to reach me, if I looked and generated stats, would I see a whole bunch of calls there? And if the answer is yes, but an ongoing thing, and, and you bring it to my attention, then we deal with code enforcement. We have to, we reach out to the landlord that this has been going on time and time again and nothing's done. And when we generate that, these stats that I just showed you, that's what I talked about at the very beginning of this. The, the, well, you, 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 you give that, this is something. You could give that address to Sue, the actual address, not the red house next to number whatever, the actual address, number and street, and I'll look up those stats and find out if, in fact, the police have ever been called. But, and if they have, and if, and if this were to continue this year, it could be a new, new people over the same owner. So, like this street, like this street here, sir? The, yep. Was that in this ward? Oh, oh, South Lane, okay. Oh, okay, okay. So it, 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 may, it may have all been addressed. There may have been criminal action. I don't have that information with me. The only way I could get the information to get back to you, and I could get back to you, you know, if, if you gave me the information. Yeah, there was, something happened here. Code enforcement acted, police made an arrest, but going back to the street that I just showed you that number, Action is taken on subsequent complaints and calls, and they, and I didn't get the end result because this was just two days ago. Did this guy actually insulate his home? Did he do all the things to keep the noise from exiting? And if he did, 
he's all set. If he didn't, there was going to be a complaint taken out against him. So I, I, calls need to be made, be, be done. And, and uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, uh, after that call, whatever street we were just talking about after this one here, there were no calls for service to that street. I forget what street we well, I didn't tell you the street because I can't. So you understand? You've got to make calls, and, and action will be taken. Oh, oh, go ahead. So I live on Pine Avenue, and so for years we've been calling because Pine Avenue is a cut through so that nobody has to go through all of the like traffic lights and everything else. Yeah. So my neighborhood is called probably for 10 years. After like the first five years, we've all kind of given up because they still fly up and down the street. I understand that you say possibly get the color, make, model, and the plate number of the cars, but when they're driving by you at like 50 miles an hour on a very short street, you can't get any of that information as to what's going on. So this has been ongoing for years and years. And like I said, we stopped calling because nothing happened. We never saw any more patrols that were coming up and down to check for it or anything else. There are kids that are in the area. And like I said, this is the, the only time that we have not had people speed on our street was when they rebuilt the bridge down by the river and you couldn't come through. Did you say Pine Ave? Pine Ave, it's right over there. No, I know, I just did it. I don't know if it was. Now, that's an example of what I just said. You could have been out there because they passed through. You could have been out there getting the plates and makes of the guy. Well, I mean, I shouldn't have to stand outside no, but, but and listen, get plates no, I, in, no, in I, cars. I, That's not my job. No, no, no. You don't understand me. You're not listening. Even if you did that and got the plates in the make and the model, the police aren't going to respond to that. Well, and that I understand, but what are you going to do to fix it is it, the question that I'm asking. Yep. Because nobody is ever on my well, street to catch them, I, I get but you. it still happens. Right. On the list to Captain John Hallisey, ahead of the Traffic Commission, to have radar done on Pine Ave. Okay, but like I said, this has been going on. It's not yep. like it's just happening this year. We, like, I can tell you that I know of at least 10 people in my neighborhood that it, we haven't called recently because it's useless. We've been calling for years and years and nothing happens, so everybody just gives up. We just figure if it's never gonna get fixed, then why keep bothering? And I can tell you that most of the traffic stops that you probably had with all the money that you had gotten has nothing to do with us small side streets. Most likely it's going to be your main roads that you're pulling these people over for traffic violations or for speeding. Very rarely is it going to be a small road like Pine Avenue or some of the other roads that are around here that people still drive up and down. But you make a, you make a legitimate complaint that goes on the list of all of the other streets that the police go down and do radar on. But they don't. This is what I'm trying to explain But I'm telling to you. you, now that you're speaking to me, all I can do is go up to the higher, the higher, the higher body, the captain. And if the captain doesn't do it, or if you don't see any police, if, you can be sure about it, if there's no police visibility, if there's nothing going on, then you've got to go to the higher up, you've got to go to the mayor or the chief. I just don't know, I just don't know how else to... So then, I have another question, though. Yep. So say I am the person that keeps calling the, calling the police station, I keep saying, this is happening, this is happening. Yep. So I have done this in the past, and I can tell you that I am not a huge person to call the police station, because on a couple of occasions when I have been calling the police, I say to them, if you have any questions about what it is I'm calling you about, please call me back on my cell phone. No one calls me back on my cell phone, and the next thing I know, I have a cruiser in my driveway, and they're banging on my door asking me what's going on. Well, I don't want you in my driveway because there are people in my neighborhood that I don't want to know that I am actually the one calling the police. Because in my neighborhood, there's retaliation on certain things like that. You're on TV. That's fine. I don't mind. I, I right, mean, I'm seriously, just... I mean, I get it that that's what it is. But what I'm explaining to you is that that's why I don't call, because they pull into my driveway and they'll, say, they'll bang on my door and want to know what's going on. Why can't, I know you know my phone number, even if I call 911, you're the police station. So why can't they just call me back and ask me questions instead of pulling into my driveway or pulling into anybody's driveway at that matter and, and asking questions because that just puts it as if we're the ones that are always calling the police and then that makes everybody in the neighborhood think that we're all the ones you. that are snitching yep. and then you get your car windows broken, your tires get yep. flat, you know, they, they shoot BB guns at your house. I mean, I've had people in my neighborhood that have had BB guns shot at their house. So I, I don't understand, like my problem is, is that I feel that the police sometimes don't actually take like our side of it, I guess. Like I understand that you're a cop, you can do whatever it is that you want to, but we're just regular people that live here and we don't want all of that retaliation back. I get you. 
so I have no, like, so there's really no way for us to contact you or to do anything about certain things because in my neighborhood, I can tell you nothing happens usually. So people will call and they'll complain and complain and complain and we never see anything fixed. Okay. So uh, just one thing, when you say you made the phone call to the uh, cell phone, do you mean the station and, yes. asked that they, and asked that they call you back? I didn't get that. Or did no, you call? it's not that they didn't call me back. I asked them if they had any issues about what I was calling for at the time or any questions that they needed to ask me in addition, could they please call me on my cell phone? Oh, I get you. Regarding and instead he pulled into my driveway. So, so now it's just, now I'm just a big, huge target that says, oh, this lady called the police. So I am now one of the people that I don't call the police when there's certain things wrong in my neighborhood because yeah. then I have a police officer come into my house and wanting to know what's going on. Okay, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you, I'm, do you have a pen there? Or I'll, 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 I'll give it to you after. Mm -hmm. You're going to e email jhallisey at brockdenpolice.com. He's in charge, and I'll, I'll write this out to you after I'm done here. He's in charge of traffic issues, speeders. You email him that. This is all I can tell you. This is all because I'm, I'm the position I'm in. He is in charge of traffic. He's a captain on the Brockton Police Department. So if you have issues like you're describing of Pine Ave being bombarded with speeders. Always. He, okay. He's the, and you haven't asked this before, so I'm telling you what to do. He's your main contact for all things speeding. And he will put somebody up in that area, rotate them through all of the other streets in which people have the same complaint, every, same complaint. And personally, I think the whole speeding thing, I think it's broken and it can't be fixed. It's broken and it can't be fixed. That's my personal feelings. And I get and it. So if maybe they saw more police presence in that, certain that's areas, why I want you, they might think twice about but it. But that's why I want you to do that. I want you to address him by way of email. You now have a paper copy because everything I do, I have on record. Mm -hmm. you, should be the, you should do the same thing mm -hmm. and expect satisfaction and expect somebody up there to periodically be doing radar and checking for speeders. That, that's, the, that's the person to write to, and I've told Sue this too. For certain issues like quality of life issues, you know, we have the Board of Health, we have, we have numbers to, to contact, and that's kind of my job is to like delegate the, the, the contact people. Okay. So I, I'm going to give so, you... But if I call the non-emergency police department number I, for I, that reason, it doesn't automatically I, go to him? I, I would, no, nope, I would prefer... I would prefer that, or, or you can make a phone call to him. You could, you well, I mean, I'm just saying, though, like, my thing is, is if we call the police station and say there are all kinds of speeders going up and down our street and nobody comes out to see anything, where does that phone call go? I want you to address it this way. You could call the non-emergency line, right, and ask for Captain Hallisey's extension. Okay, I, but, I, like, I, a lot of people don't know that. So, like I said, my question is, is if I just call the non-emergency... No, I don't want you to do that. I'm, like, I'm explaining to you and everybody else what I want you to do to rectify okay, the... Okay, but what I'm saying is, is most people in the community don't know. I mean, there are thousands and thousands of people in Ward 4 that aren't in here right now. I get you. That might not watch the TV. I get you. So when we call the non-emergency number to complain about something, where does that complaint go? It, does well, it just sit there because nobody wants to worry about the speeding, or does it actually no. go to the higher-up person to be able to fix it. Okay. If you said this speed is going down, if you said that the speed is going down the street, obviously the speed is going to be gone. Well, if, no, and that I understand. So what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm telling you and I want everybody, I wish there were 300 people here I w and I wish there were thousands watching. This is how you, this is, this is what I want you to do. I want you to write him. You'll have that email as your copy that the citizens on Pine Ave have an issue with speeders. Captain, who's in charge of the traffic division. Well, that I understand, but you're still not answering my question. Yeah, I can't my, answer. But, you know what? I can't answer it. I can't answer it. So I can't you don't know it. where that call goes. So does that call doesn't if, if go you, to anybody? If, well, here's the thing. If you were to say, if you were to say, the speed is down here, they're not going to enter it as a call. But, all right, well, listen, so, but I'm saying, like, most people would call a, a non-emergency number and yep. they would complain about the fact that there are speeders. You yep. want everybody in the community to call and to make complaints about certain things. But if they don't know that they're supposed to call the specific person and we call the non-emergency number, are they going to be told by the non-emergency person answering that they need to contact this person by email? I'm going to hope, that's, not, I'm, I'm gonna hope that's what they're going to do. They're okay, gonna, but if they don't, yep. where does that call go? I don't know. So then you wonder why people don't actually call because, well, because if we don't have any clue as be, to where it's well, going. Well, well here, here's, what you, here's what you don't, here, uh, under the website, the police department website and the city of Brockton website, 
this the traffic division. So most people, if you logged onto the Brockton PD website, Captain Hallisey gets 1,000 calls per month regarding speeders. Nobody would ever call the non-emergency line or the, or the 911 line and say, the speeder's here, because it doesn't generate a call. So what you do is you call him, and you could get that information on the website. But what I'm telling you and anybody who's listening here, if you email him or call him, I don't know his mm -hmm. extension, he will address the issue by putting that street on the list of the hundreds of streets in the, com on the, in the city in which there's speeders and traffic violations. That's, that's, how, that's, that's how we do it. I, I don't, I, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't do that. Anybody else? All right, thank you. Um, I'll be responsible for putting it on the various Facebook pages to contact Captain Hallisey. I'll be responsible for that. We'll put it on Ward 4 Brockton. We'll put it on the various places. And I'll be responsible at the next council meeting this coming Monday. At the end of the meeting, I'm, I'll take a moment of personal privilege and announce that, that if you're having an issue. Um, the traffic, oh. The third Thursday in Beauregard, I saw her, Councilor Beauregard. Every, the third Thursday of every month, the tra what's that? The fourth? Okay. The fourth Thursday, it's always, it's on the, it's on the uh, City of Brockton website, uh, website, traffic commission hearing in which you can lodge complaints also, and Captain Hallisey sits on that board. It's held where now? Oh, at War Memorial. War Memorial building on West, on West, uh, West Elm Street. War Memorial building on West Elm Street. He personally will be there to address those type of issues, correct? Yes. And Ann Beauregard, who, oh, there she is. She, she sits, and Councilor Lally also sits on the uh, commission. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Officer Healy. Now, we've spent a lot, a lot of time on, on uh, police involvement and on crime and traffic enforcement, I hope. I hope you got a lot out of that. I hope you learned things that you haven't known before. I want to make you aware of something. I can't quite see it. Um, in Monday night's paper, there was a legal notice about a community outreach hearing for a proposed retail marijuana establishment to be located at 1915 Main Street in Brockton, the former Jiffy Lube next to the former CVS in front of the Kmart Plaza on Main Street, that end of Main Street. Okay, well, here's the thing. It, in, it announces in that legal notice, and also in a notice to abutters that the counselors all received this afternoon by email, that that meeting is going to be held on Wednesday, May 29th at 3 p.m. at the East Branch of the Public Library. But that's not possible because the library is not open on Wednesdays. Yeah. I want you all to be aware of it because it's very confusing. So today I spoke with the library and I learned that in fact this meeting, the library, the East Branch has been reserved for Tuesday, May 28th at 3 p.m., okay? And I was given the contact person, the name of the contact person, attorney David Asak from Asak and Asak in Brockton who made all these reservations with the library and I assume is also sending out these notices with the wrong dates on it. So I want you all to know, as a courtesy, I called him and I left a message on the voicemail at the law firm to try to straighten it out so that I would have something to tell you all tonight, but he never called me back. I also wrote to the Cannabis Control Commission today just to say, well, here's the scoop. We've got an erroneous legal notice running, and what do you want me to do about this? Give me some guidance. I didn't hear from the Cannabis Com Control Commission either. But I just want you to know there's no way that hearing can be held next Wednesday at 3 p.m. The library is closed. Okay, so if you're interested in, in attending a, a hearing on a Tuesday afternoon or a Wednesday at 3 p.m., let me know, okay? My phone number is 508-897-1314. My email is su no, snacastro at cobma.us, 
and I will get you the information. I will be sure to follow up. I want you to be aware of that. Now, at this time, um, I want to make you aware of a few dates. We just announced on Monday night, and it was in yesterday's paper, that our city council budget hearings are going to be held in city council chambers on the Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, the first ones of the first week in June. So that's June 3rd, 4th, 5th, and 6th. You are welcome to attend. Very soon, we'll be getting a document this thick from the mayor and from the finance office with a proposed budget in it. We'll be going through it. If you have questions or concerns, you can call me. You can call any of the counselors at large. All the contact information is on the city council page on the website. We're very interested to know what everyone thinks, all right? At this time, I'm going to ask any of my elected officials who are here, and by the way, Ward 5 Counselor Ann Beauregard has come in since we started the meeting, and I'm grateful she's here. Um, if any of the, the elected officials would like to say a word. Anybody? I knew you wanted to say a word. Well, you know, the, oh, this is loud. Excellent. Excellent. Good evening. Uh, how are you guys doing? Good? Well, um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Jean Wedley Dunonku. Most people call me Jean. Uh, just in case you cannot remember my name, you can call me the guy with the long name. Uh, it is my distinguished uh, privilege to be here this evening. I am one of your counselors at large. And as we speak, I am actually running for mayor. Um, I listen to you, Lisa. And of course, you are not the first person who actually um, have this kind of frustrations. And one of the things that was unfortunate listening to uh, some of the statement is that we work for you folks. That's one of the things that I would like you to understand. I am your employee. Each and every single one of you is my boss. That's how I see it. Because as an elected official, the only way we can get this job is by you voting for us. And as your employer, it is my responsibility to do my job accordingly. And one of the things that I said all the time is that when you elect someone, that person must respond to you. And after I got elected, what I did, I gave out my cell phone number. I'm not going to take the time to talk too much, but I think um, in this coming up month, you will be able to hear more from me. And um, answer your questions regarding my platform but tomorrow night I'm having my campaign kickoff I'm about to be 29 years old um, I would like to invite all of you guys to come at 583 Center Street where you will be able to talk to me this is not my show this is Susan Nicastro show but I could not be more proud to have the opportunity to listen to some of you who did ask some very critical question that our city is facing let me just say something public safety is one of the most challenging issue that any city can face. But when it's come down to public safety, there's something that I would like you guys to pay attention to. When you are living in a society where people don't trust you, it becomes problematic not only for you or your neighbor, even for law enforcement. And the only reason you can actually solve problems, especially based on what you said, Lisa, you may live next to somebody, but if that person doesn't trust you to share enough information to you to actually report on certain things, that problem will never solve. There is a saying in Massachusetts, if you see something, say something. But one thing that people tell me, when they say stuff, no one listen to them. As your employer, I guess it is my responsibility to listen to you and pay attention to what you have to say. Our job as legislature, we are policy makers. We can receive the phone calls. What we do, like Bill said, we will have to call the Washington Police Department, report to them what you report to us. But don't forget, our job is to make laws. So I will do my best to advocate, to represent every single one of you. As one of your council at large, I don't care where you live, the east side, the west side, the south side, the north side, as long as you are a resident of Brockton, I work for you. And I will always do my best to do what I'm supposed to do accordingly. Thank you so much for listening to me. I also want to make sure that you're all aware that uh, next week at the Department of Environmental Protection, there's going to be a hearing on the air quality permit for the power plant. Many of you are walking around thinking the power plant is dead and buried, but its air quality permit is still alive. And there's actually an appeal of it that's going to be heard next week 
and we've we've been encouraging people to go in and be there so that the commissioner for DEP knows that Brockton still cares about this issue. Now, could a power plant still be built on Oak Hill Way? I'm not sure under the current approved um, version of it that it could, but we still have an air permit that's alive, and it's something that I want you all to be aware of. The power plant is not dead, not by any means. If any of you are available, get in touch with me. I'm, I'm going to go in. I'm going to drive in. I have room in my car. There are other people driving in. We'd love to have you to show uh, the DEP that we care about what happens on Oak Hill Way. Loretta. Thank you. They have an okay now, and it's still under watch. They're, they're not clear. But the transition field that they have in their plans has been sold to another company. That's it's right. not available. That's right. Doesn't that mean that they have to revamp all those plans and go back and start at day one with everything all over? That's a major change. Yes, I would think so. I also think it's incredibly odd that the Energy Facility Siding Board continues to allow the permit, which was you know, issued almost 10 years ago to be alive. Very, very odd. And I've asked Senator Brady's office to look into it. I have not heard back yeah, yet. They, they should not have that permit even considered if they've got major changes in the plan because it has to go back That's right. and be done over. The technology is all dated at the very least. It, it's certainly not state of the art. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Loretta. Okay. Um, Councilor Bullergaard would like to say something. Oh, I'm sorry. First, Councilor Farwell. I'm Councilor Lajwin Farwell. Even with my extra padding, those seats aren't exactly that comfortable, so I'm going to be quick. Uh, we have a wonderful police department, but everywhere we go, and my colleagues will bear this out, we hear, we call the police, and we either don't see them or we don't get the problem resolved. I don't know what it is. Many of you know I worked at the police department for 25 years, gave out hundreds of traffic tickets. It's a wonderful experience. But if you gave out four tickets, if we had four motor vehicle citations issued each shift, times three shifts, that's 12 per day, that's 84 per week, that's about 4,300 a year. And I'm not sure that we're issuing 4,300 tickets. I just happened to look up on the internet, the town of Hingham has 10, 10, one zero, traffic officers. Now, we spend a lot of money in overtime. We've got a traffic safety problem. You've seen some of the crashes. Next, I want to move on to fireworks. I don't expect the police to be able to respond to every fireworks call. But we do have supervisors. I was one of them. Somebody should go out and look and see what's going on and then radio back to the station. Either I can handle it or send a couple of more officers down. We had about twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars worth of fireworks shot off in Market Street last year. Some of the incendiaries went over 200 feet into other neighborhoods. When the smoke cleared, and I'm not being funny, they found a guy that had been shot in the stomach lying on a lawn. Now, we know July 4th is coming. I would hope that the police chief is meeting with, with his command staff, and he's looking at the crime statistics. We have a crime analyst. What days of the week? What hours of the day do we have a lot of service calls and get some extra people in? Call the midnight shift in early at 8 o'clock, have the 4 to 12 shifts stay over four hours. I don't care how you do it, but if we don't start addressing these issues, we're going to lose people from this city. I mean, we owe people a proactive police department. We owe them peace and quiet. We owe them an opportunity to enjoy their neighborhoods, their families, and you know, if you hear it once or twice, I dismiss it as somebody's got a problem. But we hear it constantly that apparently people don't feel the police are addressing their needs. Now, I think part of it is that we don't communicate back to the complainant well. If we're busy with a horrendous accident and all the cruises are tied up, explain that to the person. Just tell the other person, that, uh, tell the complainant who's calling, we can't get there, we'll probably be tied up for an hour, we'll get there as quickly as we can. So I think a lot of it is communication, and we're all guilty of it. We all text now and communicate by Facebook, and we never really take the time to talk to one another. But 
something's got to be done. The status quo is not working. Um, you know, you're going to hear a lot of stuff between now and Election Day. It's an election year. My God, you're going to hear programs, promises, and projects that you never thought were possible. But the bottom line is we owe our residents increased efficiency. We owe them proactivity. We do owe them economic development. But before we start bringing in a lot more housing, before we start worrying about these massive projects, let's improve the life of the people who live here. Streets reconstructed, strong schools, proactive police department, to me that's a start. That's where I'm coming from. I make no apologies for it. I'm not being critical. I'm just giving you my observations. Now, last thing I will say is the council can only request to the police department or the mayor something. We can't require it unless we pass an ordinance because we're the legislative division of city government, the executive division, or the administration. So I'm not, you know, I have my differences with the mayor, but he is the chief executive officer. A lot of these issues, like the young lady in the back, call his office and say, look, I'm having a problem. You can direct someone to handle that, either in your office or at the police department and then it will filter down to Bill Healy, and I know he will do his very best. I worked with him for years. But you're really going to have to call the counselors, but you're also going to have to call the mayor's office because he directs the day-to-day -day operation of city government. We don't. And uh, we'll, we'll all work together as a team. We'll do the best we can, and hopefully you'll keep us, you'll hold our feet to the fire to make sure we do what we're supposed to do. So thank you very much for listening. Go ahead. My, uh, one of my dear friends, I just want to tell him something here. In 2018, yep. 6,603 motor, motor vehicle moving violations. If you divide that by 365 days in the year, that's 18.09 tickets given per day. Okay, so six per, six per shift. Six per shift. Well, I... I don't really, the, the question is how many violations do I want? I don't have a specific number. What I want, which is six per shift, in an eight hour shift. That, that's, that, you know, he, he brought up a point. Let me just finish this. You pull a car over, you're gonna give out a citation. All of a sudden you get an emergency call. Guess what? You take this out, you take a picture of the driver's license, you take a picture of the registration, you tell the person, sorry, I've got an emergency call, I'm going to mail you a citation, and off you go. It's not a big deal. It's not. So, thank you. We're just trying to keep everything transparent. We're trying to give you all the information we can, as um, Councillor Nicastro met, public hearing, People can come and speak on their frustrations, their ideas, or their questions on June 3rd. All these meetings are public, unless otherwise mentioned. And we cannot encourage enough that people either watch them on television, BCA, here, Professor Tebow, Aaron, taping this tonight, or um, attend the meetings. I mean, for example, many of you were uh, at the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals last week and showing up and speaking up gets results, and you won quite the battle. And as far as this Cannabis Commission situation, I mean, it's still relatively new. It's a little frustrating for us, you know, because it's statewide, and we have various announcements. Zoning Board of Appeals has something. There's a proposal for a pot shop at um, Westgate Mall, you know, campus. There is one um, coming up proposal again on, um, what do I want to say, Pearl Street. And the thing is, is, okay, you're in Ward 4, but the thing is, is this is all over, and it's necessary to know. And people like myself do anything in their power to keep you informed and educated. Because first of all, you have the right to know, and second of all, the more you know, the more power you have, and it's, it's more beneficial to you. I mean, I'm the Ward 5 City Councilor, 774-297-4939. Uh, it's aborg out at cobma.us. But I want to let people know that there's going to be activity downtown. And if you're trying to get around, and you, know, you might see streets detours as there is right now with the parking garage, there'll be more as the infamous Ganley building comes down. And it was just a parking authority, and they were looking for the setup. They're going to be, um, what they call it, the layout 
when they start demolishing a building and then getting ready to uh, build. So it looks like that'll be in July. And it's May now, and we're loving the weather. And uh, we'll be loving the weather in July, too. But, I mean, just preparing people to be aware of seeking alternate routes, et cetera. And um, this pops up. I know a lot of you don't always go on the website. And, I mean, and some of you do the paper, some of you don't. And we have community access. So we try to pass the information on as many people as we, as we can. And uh, that is just so vital. Because, and if you hear something, pass it on to others because it's a time now when people have the right to know a lot of that's going on. So, good luck. Thank you. Um, I've got someone in the audience who'd like to ask a question. Um, as opposed to a question, it's more of a comment. Um, Officer Healy, I respectfully just want to point out one poignant statement that you made. I think the statistics are important, but the fact that you mentioned that this is an ongoing problem that you don't see a foreseeable resolution in is a little bit scary to me as far as the traffic. I think, um, I'm sorry, I don't know everyone. I'm, I'm Councillor Farwell. Farwell, I think you've made some poignant points, but a key aspect of it all is collaboration between law enforcement and, and the residents. I think what this woman pointed out is extremely imperative, should be to you, in reference to the fact that it's an ongoing issue, one that poses a great concern to not only her safety, but that of her community. And statistics, at the end of the day, do not obviously demonstrate in what is to what is going on in the city. I've lived in Brockton for quite some time. I'm now a new resident of Country Club Drive, and I think what's important is there need to be there needs to be collaboration and great consideration given to not complaints or people venting, but what the true issues are. Um, statistics are great, but what stood out to me is that 11 people got killed in this city walking the streets, which is uh, completely unbelievable to me. So I think this gentleman in the red hat pointed out a good point also. If there are patterns that should be utilized, that data, however it's collected through the calls, how it's you know, grouped together should be utilized as a form of, I mean, healthcare tertiary prevention. I think a huge aspect living in Brockton to really minimizing this activity, whether it's traffic or drugs, is present. If you know there's a pattern in a certain area, I know you guys are understaffed, but even if it's just knowing that, stay off of that street because you know, law enforcement comes in at this time, at least it may potentially minimize to a point where people may not even want to run the risk of running into you guys and keep them out of there. I think community collaboration is imperative. Listening to what the residents are telling you, not really trying to prove to them that it is not what they are living every day. I give you guys credit for giving out so many tickets, but at the end of the day, there is an issue. As someone who potentially will have young kids running the streets, this is a big issue for me. Between Route 24 between Boston into into the Bridgewaters, 85, 90 miles an hour. I'm going. I'm going 65. It's it's. That's what I meant by broken and kitten, not Brockton. Okay. Everywhere. Absolutely. Everywhere. And you know, all you gotta do is drive around. All of us. That's no, all. I drive into Boston every day. And you I know how bad it is. I understand it's a huge issue. But I think the only other point I would make is I'm not too sure how much community collaboration events have gone on with the police department in the community. But I think things that will really try to bridge what is an apparent disconnect is imperative. I think more than anything for the community to trust in the work that is being done by the police department because you guys are doing the best under, under the constraints of not having enough staff and being in a city that is, needs the support and is growing exponentially. But thank you. Thank you, great comments. I wanna, I wanna encourage all of you to start a neighborhood watch in your neighborhood. If you, if you had one and it, it fell apart a few years ago, like the one I was in, 
restart it. Talk to your neighbors. It's so important to know your neighbors. Just, you, you don't have to live their lifestyle or be their best friends, but you do have to know who they are, have a phone number for them. We still have a chain, that, a phone chain, that if something goes wrong in our neighborhood, we invoke it, and it really is very comforting to have everybody on the same page. Someone else have a comment? Ben? Over here. I just want to thank the representatives that stood up with us at that zoning board meeting late in the evening and, and helped us to make that victory as somebody who lives on Coral Street. And uh, from what I was told by somebody um, who's very knowledgeable, we stopped them for a whole year. They cannot apply, from what I understand, for another permit for a whole year. So they thank can. you. They can. But they have to go through the planning board, so it will take them some time. Yes. Thank you. Over to Mr. Bosco, Ben. Hi, I just had a question for the officer. In your opinion, I heard tonight that, um, that the Brockton Police Department is understaffed. Do you believe it's understaffed? And by how many officers would you, you've been on the force a while, how understaffed do you believe the Brockton staff is? So um, I always, when I go to these meetings, be it Ward or Crime Watch, I never say those words. Others have, yep. but I believe, first I know since I've been on here since 88, we have more men now and women, more men and women now, more diverse, more diverse than ever since 1988 um, at this point than we have in the 31 years I've been here. Ideally, and everybody, this is everybody's wish list, I think Fall River and New Bedford have like 240 police officers. We would rule the city with 240 police officers. How many do we have? Uh, 190, 190 plus, and the only reason why I don't have an exact number, and I should, it, it's actually been so fluid with the amount of people. On. Yep. They've, co they've come on so quick in the past two years, so, but ideally, and it's pie in the sky. Why um, is it pie in the uh, sky? No, 245, 245, mm -hmm. like to, to get to that magic number, yep. 245, cost. Okay, but. Very expensive. It would, right. be, it would be very expensive. So you've said well, that Would Wynn agree with me? 240, 245 would be like un unbelievable. Like so you said that. that there are four police officers assigned to traffic De for the entire city of Brockton. Designated to the traffic unit. Mm -hmm. All police officers in uniform while on patrol conduct traffic enforcement. These guys are designated to traffic only. Mm -hmm. You understand? Yep. So in between... The call takers, the guy that goes to the 911 calls, in between, he may come across a car that goes through a red light, pull him over for failing to stop for a red light, issue a citation, give a warning. So everybody who's out there on patrol, and even people in unmarked units, expect them also, we're all out there doing traffic enforcement. But the traffic division in the department, so we're clear, four people giving tickets all the time, with a captain in charge of those four. So, so, as a resident of Brockton my entire life, yeah. I've looked at it as when I've needed uh, to call on the, on the police for their assistance, I've found over the last 15 years that uh, staffing is probably one of the problems that the city faces. Yes. So my question is, we've, the city council has brought up the uh, budget hearing coming up. You know, as a taxpayer, in a, in a state that I believe has the resources to be able to provide us residents with the proper police staffing. You know, you can say what the levels are. I don't believe there's enough police that are actually in the streets doing the job of police. When I grew up driving a car and I would go down the street, you, I was 18 years old. I sped faster than I should have. But I had the fear of someone, an officer in a cruiser gonna get me. I don't think children, kids or adults today fear that at all. In fact, I've seen police on doing other things other than um, in seeing violations at red lights and you could never, you couldn't have got away with that when you were in a police officer. When you were a kid and you ran a red light, you would have been pulled over. 
You would have the fear of God that you would have been pulled over. Yep. Today, we don't have that. We don't have the staffing levels. What I'm saying is we should have the staffing levels. And if we're not, our public servants, our political leaders are failing us. They're, they're not funding what we pay our hard taxes for. All of us with these fireworks, and all of these parties, and all of that crap, we shouldn't put up with it. The state has enough money. I don't know why our state delegation isn't here to listen to this. They're the ones who have the money at the state house, who should be bringing it back to Brockton to pay for offices on the street. So when we need them and we call you, you have the resources to respond. You know, our frustrations, I hear these people, I've lived the same thing. I have a scanner. When I call the police, I know when they're not coming because I listen to it on the scanner. And the same frustrations with these fireworks. This year, I don't know what I will do because on the 5th of July, I have to go to work. Last year at 3, I let the fireworks, people have their fun. But at 1 o'clock in the morning, I call. At 1.30, I call. At 2 o'clock, I call. At 2.30, I call. At 2.45, I'm out in the street with the phone, and the officer that I'm calling at the station can't hear me because the fireworks are going off just like they do at the Brockton Fair. And the officer, I can't hear you. I know you can't. And I know you're not coming because I'm listening to the scanner. Because if there were enough officers, when I had a police officer, across the street from me who lived there. I didn't have fireworks. You know why? At 11.45, he got in his personal car, he got his radio, and he got his gun. And he went down to that neighbor who's still there today, and he shut the party down himself. I heard him on the police radio call, call in, and he said, send me three cruisers, and I want them now. Mm -hmm. Now that's poli you know, community policing that we used to have. We don't have that anymore. And, when you don't have enough resources to call upon, that's what you got. So I'm saying for our delegation that's going for city council in mayor, we need more resources. And if the city doesn't have it in our tax revenue, why aren't we getting state aid? Because the state controls a lot of money. Our school department, when my children were going to school, busing was paid for by the state. Then the state coffers started to go down. So the state stopped funding busing. Well, the state coffers are back up. Did they replenish Brockton for that money? No. This, what is the state spending that money that we used to get? Our city leaders have to start fighting for us with our state delegation and to our state leaders that the money for local aid has to start coming to local aid and stop spending it on whatever else you're spending it on. Uh, yep. So, just uh, so uh, j just so that there's no, th that's my personal opinion. How 245 would change the world. That's just my opinion. 245 officers, and I always forget to say this to people when I start. I've lived in the city since '82, and I still reside here. So I'm in it together with everybody else. And the majority of police officers that I represent, 150 or so, the majority live in the city now. So. Just let you know that. Okay, Monell. Annabelle. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Some of you know me. My name is Annabelle. Um, I hear everyone. I am a part of you. I've lived in the city of Brockton over 35 years um, plus. I want everybody in this room to think about it. I want everybody in this room to hear me. I voted for the mayor of Brockton, not once, twice. We now need to take a good look. I personally have seen some things that I'm not happy with. I think it's important that the mayor knows we want the Brockton police to have more officers. That's one for me. Number two, I want the mayor to come out to some of these meetings. Um, I, I want him to hear what our concerns are. I want the mayor to know that communication in the south, the west, the north, the east side is very important. But most importantly is we're getting older. Half of Brockton is younger 
half of Brockton is older, and nobody is going anywhere. But I want the mayor to understand. I see your signs to reelect you. I think you've tried, and I think you need to come out to these meetings and hear what people are asking. The, our police office, everybody is full. The schools are full. Yes, and some of the parents, I have to say it, some of the parents were not taking responsibility, but that's a whole nother issue. We need the mayor to understand we care about Ward 4, we care about uh, 5, 3, 2, we care about all the wards. Come out, hear what we have to say, and listen, because election time is coming. This is not um, taking shots at police or our, our councilmen, because everybody's hands are tied, but I see other mayors in other towns, they come out. They come out, and if you don't, not that I'm in control, everybody, you cast your vote. That's all I'm saying. I thank you. One last comment, Who's, who wants it? Mr. Hersey wants it. Thank you. You knew you, you knew you weren't going to get away with all week too long. I want to tell people something concerning what Ann Beauregard said. Now, if you believe in freedom, democracy, and the right to vote, as many of our American citizens at one time or another died for that, the marijuana situation, we had five counselors who stood up for you people to give you people the right to vote. The state, we voted the state to legalize marijuana, but it didn't take the cities and towns right away from them to vote. We had five counselors who stood up for you. Gene Bradley, Ann Beauregard, Wynn Faro, Bob Sullivan, and Susan Castro. They said, give the people the right to vote. Unfortunately, six counselors turned their back on you and didn't give you the right to vote. So when you go to the polls, remember those five names. Nicastro, Beauregard, Bradley, Gene Bradley, Wynn Farrell, and Bob Sullivan, because they wanted to give you the right to vote on the marijuana shops in Brockton, whether you wanted it or didn't want it. But the other six counselors said, no, we're not going to give you the right to vote. And if anybody here is a veteran or had a veteran in your family, that was a disgraceful vote. And I agree with you, ma'am, 100%. The mayor needs to be more transparent. He needs to go out there and talk to people, open meetings. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that's another Ward 4 meeting. I don't know about all of you, but I've learned so much. Thank you to all of you viewers at home. Thank you for coming. We'll have another one again in the fall. Good night. <laughs>